Greetings friends around the world and uh, welcome to another very important message. This is perhaps one of the most important messages that I've ever delivered to you. And namely, that message concerns the time in which we are living or rather the uh, pivotal event just ahead of us which will be the basically uh, nuclear, regional nuclear conflict between uh, the uh, countries in the Middle East, primarily the State of Israel, as well as the countries like Iran and Syria. I felt moved to warn you about this, because recently I've been following the Jerusalem Post and its writings. In those writings, the uh, topic of Iran and Iranian nuclear facilities are very prominent and I've realized from what they've been uh, doing in Israel by upgrading their uh, defense capabilities and uh, other other things, also having a drill that was a military drill like attack on Iran, I've realized that this is no longer uh, an analysis of potential situation or potential crisis in the Middle East, but I realized, my dear friends, that this is actually something that is going to happen. Uh, the conflict in the Middle East is just a matter of time, whether it will be in several weeks or several months or perhaps in a year or two or three. Uh, the thing is that it is down the road and it is waiting just right around the corner. And I feel that it was the topic worthy of uh, attention. But not only that, but I realized that the Bible prophecy speaks about this coming conflict anyway. Because Iran and the state of Israel have been involved in essentially a cyber war with occasional sabotage and death for the past several years. And both players have threatened destruction of the other. And both can cause the other serious damage. So the question is, how will it end up? Well, the Bible certainly has the answer to that pivotal question. Notice something, please. This is now in uh, the prophet Isaiah, or Isaiah. Chapter 22, and please, uh, uh, I'm going to be, I'll be reading from New King James Version. Notice something that the prophet Isaiah was inspired to write. This is Isaiah chapter 22, verse 6. Elam, he says, Elam, so it's E-L-A-M, bore the quiver with chariots of men and horsemen. And Kir, K-I-R, uncovered the shield. Verse 7. It shall come to pass that your choicest valleys shall be full of chariots. And the horsemen shall send themselves in array at the gate. Verse 8. He removed the protection of Judah. Now this is the key element in this prophecy. Removal of the protection of Judah. He removed the protection of Judah. You looked in that day to the armor of the house of the forest. You also saw the damage to the city of David. That it was great. Now you know that the city of David is part of the uh, modern city of Jerusalem, and you gathered together the waters of the lower pool. You numbered the houses of Jerusalem and the houses you broke down to fortify the wall. You also made a reservoir between the two walls for the water of the old pool, but you did not look to its maker, nor did you have respect for him who fashioned it long ago. So this is a section from Isaiah chapter 22, verse 8 through 11. Now, you need to understand, friends, that uh, the modern nations are mentioned in the Bible not by their current names, with only several exceptions, like Ethiopia, Egypt, Libya, and Persia, because Iran used to be called until very recently, until recent times it used to be called Persia. But with those exceptions, the other countries are basically named after the uh, after their ancestors. So Elam, when it, when it says to Elam, uh, the, uh, who is mentioned in, in verse 6, Elam is a reference to at least some in Iran. Iran is an interesting, very interesting conglomeration of people. Uh, the continued Church of God, and I myself, uh, the continued Church of God believes what its predecessor, the Worldwide Church of God, established in this research. And there was one article published in uh, July, August 1986, uh, entitled South Asia, South Asian Prophecy in the, uh, in the magazine at that time called The Plain Truth. 
And uh, Keith Stump says the following, Iranians comprise nearly 70% of the country. Iranians, though Islamic, are totally distinct from the neighboring Arab peoples of the Middle East. They are a mixed people of the remnants of Media and Elam and other ancest ancestors of Semitic and Hamitic stock. Semitic stock, of course, it means uh, it's the white race and the uh, Hamitic stock, basically Ham, uh, Ham, Ham is the ancestor of the of the uh, people who have black colored skin. So you see, Iranian I Iranian people are completely different from their Arab neighbors. Now, as far as the identity of this Kir K I R, -R where it goes? Well, you certainly know that there was a Persian ruler, Cyrus, but this is not Cyrus. You see, this is a different spelling. It's K I R. And as far as the identity of that. Uh, term goes there are several possibilities one is that the Bible tells that uh, after Tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria took over Damascus the capital of Syria that he moved Syrians to the area called Kir, K-I-I-R now while this does not mean that K-I-R, Kir must or must only be a reference to Syria the fact that Syria is an ally of Iran is indeed interesting because some believe that KIR, the Kir, is an area in the south of Iran, while others suggest closer that it's an area closer to the Black Sea. Now, God's word has the expression in Amos chapter 9 verse 7, has the expression, the Syrians from Kir. So there is that expression in Amos chapter 9 uh, verse 7, which is basically confirmation that Kir of Isaiah 22 would include Syrians. The Bible also tells of a time that Kir will be destroyed. If you check Isaiah chapter 15 verse 1, at the end of verse 1, you'll find that Kir will be destroyed. And they also the Bible also says that Syria's capital, Damascus, will be destroyed. There will be It will be reduced to rubbles. It's uh, mentioned in Isaiah chapter 17 verse 1. Now, since Syria is Iran's closest ally, military cooperation between the two nations, of course, against Israel, looks very consistent with the prophecy of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 22. Now, speaking of Damascus, I just want to mention that uh, when there was a crisis with the Islamic State, ISIS, um, in that clash between the Syrian government forces and the Islamic State, uh, Damascus did suffer some damage, but it was not reduced to rubble at all. Damascus is still there, well and alive, and kicking. Uh, some other towns and other places were destroyed, like the city of Aleppo, for example, but Damascus itself is still intact, which means that the prophecy that is there in Isaiah chapter 17, verse 1, was not really referring to the uh, conflict with the uh, Islamic State, but it was the prophecy in reference to another time, most likely to this coming nuclear uh, regional conflict between between Israel, the state of Israel, and Iran and its close ally Syria. Now please let's go back to Isaiah chapter 22. Now let's uh, review verse 8, which mentions Judah. Now of course we all realize that Judah, and that there is the uh, term the house of Judah and the house of Israel in the Bible, there are two distinct houses. But when it says Judah in, uh, in the Bible, it's a reference to those in the land commonly called Israel or the state of Israel. And the Bible shows that God will allow the state of Israel to be attacked, you see, because the uh, protection of Judah will be removed. And in verse 9, consider that the damage to the city of David is a reference to at least part of Jerusalem. Because, as you know, Jews have declared Jerusalem uh, to be their eternal capital eternal capital, and of course, that position is very consistent with damage to happen to Israel, as prophesied in Isaiah chapter 22. Now further also, please notice that prophecy states that the damage will be great. And also notice part of the reason will be because Israel will not truly look to its maker. You see, just relying on its own military uh, strength will not be enough in that conflict. Now, we in the continuing Church of God and uh, those of us who have been following prophetic events, we have long believed that we may very well see a regional war as Israel has, uh, number one, taken preemptive actions in the past, and number two, said it would do so in the future to prevent Iran from getting a nuclear bomb. Now, such a regional war 
could indeed trigger the deal of Daniel chapter 9 verse 27. That's another element in the Bible prophecy that is very important to understand. And it should also, uh, you know, it will trigger that deal and it will also trigger the final three and a half year countdown until the start of the great tribulation that Jesus Christ warned us about in Matthew 24, 21. Um, now, actual and perceived threats from Israel are likely to trigger Iran, as well as Syria, its close ally, to attack and lead to the peace deal, as we call it, of Daniel 9, verse 27. Let's explain now these things. You see, these are interesting things that we need to understand. They're just ahead of us. Again, I don't know exactly the time setting. I cannot be, you know, I'm not, I don't want to give you any false prediction. But this is going to happen, I don't know, in several weeks, in several months, perhaps in a year or two or three, I don't know. But anyway, it's, pre it's prophesied in the Holy Scriptures. So, the actual and perceived threats from Israel are likely again to trigger Iran, as well as Syria, to attack. And that will lead to the peace deal of Daniel 9.27. Before we go to Daniel 9.27, I just want to draw your attention to the fact that Iran, too, is expected to have devastation. Devastation, you know, from that coming conflict. And this, even from multiple nations. And uh, to back that up, we need to go to Jeremiah chapter 49, verse 34. Jeremiah chapter 49. In verse 34, just above the verse, you have the subtitle, which says, basically, judgment on Elam, so that's judgment on Iran. Verse 34, the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet against Elam, Elam, in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah king of Judah, saying, thus says the Lord God of hosts, behold, I'll break the bow of Elam, the foremost of their might. Against Elam I'll bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven and scatter them toward all those winds. There shall be no nations where the outcasts of Elam will not go. For I'll cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies and before those who seek their life. I'll bring disaster upon them, my fierce anger, says the Lord, and I'll send the sword after them until I've consumed them. I'll set my throne in Elam and will destroy from there a, the king and the princes, says the Lord." But it shall come to pass in the latter days, I'll bring uh, back the captives of Elam, says the Lord. Well, you've just noticed uh, uh, the uh, verses 34 and verse 35. So, uh, you know, in verse 34, you know, it says there'll be multiple nations, but perhaps mainly the damage will come from the nation, which we know as the state of Israel, most likely. But anyway... In Jeremiah 49, we see the prophecy that uh, devastation of Iran will be indeed great. And that regional war will come to the Middle East. And as I said, it could be relatively soon. I don't know exactly when, but it is prophesied to happen. And then as the result, the trigger, this uh, terrible conflict will upset the whole world because uh, ever since the last century, uh, the Middle East was considered to be the powder keg. The powder keg that could incite the war that would involve and encompass the entire world. And even to this day, there are these fears that, you know, whatever happens then in the Middle East will indeed trigger the worldwide, a worldwide conflict. Now, amidst those fears that will be when that regional war starts, somebody is going to step in. You see, for a long time, the European Union, the European super state, has wanted to indeed get involved and meddle into the Middle East problems. And for a long time, the European Union has been trying on its own to find uh, a way to peace in that region and to negotiate about that peace. And they wanted to, they, of course, with the, 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 the main aim to basically push out America and American interests out of the Middle East. And so, while the conflict will break out, you know, in the Middle East, Europe is going to step in. Europe is going to send its envoy, envoy, and uh, to send its peace broker, let's call him that way, the man who is going to indeed broker the peace in the Middle East. And the, the result of that will be the uh, peace deal that would be uh, confirmed for seven years. Now, we read about that in Daniel chapter, uh, chapter 9, and I already referred to that, you know, earlier. Uh, but because of the importance of this, of this very, uh, information, uh, I'm going to read it in several translations. 
In Daniel chapter 9, verse 26 and 27, the New King James Version says, verse 26, And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood. Until the end of the war, desolations are determined. Then, verse 27, he shall confirm a covenant. You see, this peace deal is called a covenant with many of one, for one week. It's one prophetic week and one week has seven days. And by, by the principal a day for a war, for a day for a year, we know that one week will be seven years. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. Well, I said I'll be reading several uh, several uh, translations, but I think it is pretty clear, so I don't need to read this really in several translations. This is this what I've just read seems to be clear enough to give you a good interpretation. So in these two verses of Daniel chapter 9, we learn that a deal called a covenant will be confirmed for one prophetic week, seven years, and then be broken in the middle by one referred to as a prince. Now this is a prince of the group that was also prophesied to destroy the city of Jerusalem, as verse 26 points to, and this destruction was done by, as you know, the Roman Emperor, uh, Empire in 70 AD, which at that time dominated Europe and had European soldiers. They were the ones who destroyed the, uh, the, 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 the city of Jerusalem in its siege, and that happened in the first century of our, of our time, of our era. So you see, the, the prince, so this prince, thus, the prince of Daniel 9.27, would need to be not American, not Asian, not African, has to be a European. And likely it will be the one with connection to what was later known as the Holy Roman Empire. The Holy Roman Empire was a medieval formation. It was Germanic, Germanic by its character, but it was spiritually directed by the Roman Catholic Church. And it was called the Holy Roman Empire. Now we have this prince. You see, normally princes have slight influence, but no major power until they become kings, and most princes do not become kings nevertheless. But in uh, Daniel chapter 9, verse 26 and verse 27, we we have read about this prince, and then when we read some other uh, verses in Daniel chapter, chapter 11 this time, we realize that this prince mentioned in chapter 9 later does become a king. And we're going to see this now in uh, Daniel chapter chapter 11, verse 27, 31, and 40. So Daniel chapter 11, and here is the verse 27. Both these kings' hearts shall be bent on evil, and they shall... So they're talking about kings now, no longer princes. And they shall speak lies at the same table. But it shall not prosper, for the end will still be at the appointed time. That was verse 27. So we have two kings. Verse 31 says, verse 31 says the following, And forces shall be mastered by him, and they shall defile the sanctuary fortress, and they shall take away the daily sacrifices and place there the abomination of desolation. And now verse 41, it says, uh, or shall we read rather verse 40, verse 40 that is, at the time of the end, the king of the south, that will be the, uh, the king of the south, will be the head of the Arab, Arab confederation, shall attack him and the king of the north. So now we have the king of the north. North of the holy on the promised land is Europe. And European super state and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, horsemen and with many ships. Of course, these are, uh, uh, Prophet Daniel was describing the uh, war machinery in terms that he could understand at his time because at, the, at that time there were no tanks, there were no machine guns and other uh, modern weapons that we know uh, as, as we know them today. So at, at that time, what he saw in a vision, he could only sc explain in his own way, in his own terms. So those are the chariots, horsemen, many ships. That's all the war machinery. And he shall enter the countries, or overwhelm them and pass through. So we have this, the king of the north. So this prince of Daniel 9 
becomes king. Obviously, as a result of brokering the peace deal in the Middle East, he will be celebrating and he becomes the king of the north, the king of Europe. That means the president of Europe, or rather the dictator of Europe. So you see, but the thing, what is part of his biography of that coming European dictator. Now, this is interesting. This is very interesting. And part of his biography is mentioned in Daniel chapter 11, verse 21. And here is the Duai Rames translation. So, chapter Daniel chapter 11, verse 21. And there shall stand up in his place one despised, and the kingly honor shall not be given him. And he shall come privately and shall obtain obtain the kingdom by fraud. So, this coming king of the north, this is how he'll come into power. Now here is also the um, Bible in contemporary language uh, translation, Daniel chapter il, uh, chapter uh, eleven verse twenty one. Uh, so I just wanted to see the different sense in those different translations. But you know we we get the we get the gist of the matter. The gist of the matter is that there is something in biography of this coming European dictator. That that's how we can even when we analyze various politician political figures today, we can suspect who that person might be. He says in verse twenty one, this is uh, again the Bible in contemporary language, uh, verse twenty one of Daniel eleven. His place will be taken by a reject, a man spurned and passed over for advancement. He'll surprise everyone, seemingly coming out of nowhere, and will seize the kingdom. Now here is American Standard Version, the same verse. And in his place shall stand up a contemptible person to whom they had not given the honor of the kingdom. But he shall come in time of security and shall obtain the kingdom by flatteries. So, you know, this is the description of that coming European dictator. Now, dear friends, mark this very well. I have made several references in the last year or so about this person. There is a man right now who once held political offices who might be considered as a prince. It's former economics minister and then defense minister of Germany. His full name is Baron Karl Theodor Maria Nikolaus Johann Jacob Philipp Franz Josef Sylvester Fracher von und zu Gutenberg, commonly known as, commonly referred to as KT, Karl Theodor to Gutenberg. Now he is a prince. He is also a descendant of Leopold II, the Holy Roman Emperor in the late 18th century. So he is a prince because, you know, he has an aristocratic background. He is related to the Habsburg dynasty that was uh, part of the, and was very important part in maintaining and uh, ruling for a while over Europe as part of that Holy Roman Empire, dominated again by the Catholic Church and being Germanic in its origin. And it is interesting that, you know, uh, Karl Theodor was considered to have had a major chance to become Chancellor of Germany before a plagiarism scandal in 2011. And, you know, when that plagiarism scandal broke out, in a sense... Karl Theodor zu Gutenberg was a man spurned and passed over for advancement, as the message version of Daniel 11.21 indicated, you see. Uh, perhaps you may find the following Greek Orthodox prophecy of one called the Greek Monarch interesting. Uh, here is a quote from uh, the Greek Monarch and, sec and the Third World War in Orthodox Roman Catholic and Scriptural Prophecy anyway. It was published in 2000, page 32, and here is the quote from... Um, uh, uh, Anomoi paraphrases the, uh, from the 10th century. This coming European dictator is described as, quote, men thought of, men thought of him that he is a nobody and useful for nothing. End of the quote. So, you see, after that plagiarism scandal in 2011, many wrote Baron Gutenberg off. But, uh, also interestingly, even though many have rejected, ridiculed, and despised him for plagiarism after the Baron, Baron resigned, some have suggested that he should rise up again as Germany needs him. And despite being out of public office, Herr Gutenberg uh, has also 
shown repeated public interest in political matters, including Iran. You need to understand, you'll find it on, 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 on internet if you haven't already. Uh, he was indeed involved in, uh, already drawing some kind of, uh, drawing some kind of peace deal that should involve Iran and, uh, and 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 some kind of peace deal that should be implemented in, in the Middle East. So he's and he's by the way the only German as far as I know that was involved in such project. He's a person of very extensive uh, foreign uh, experience because Germans are kind of close minded, a very close nation. They there are not many Germans that have such an extensive and rich uh, foreign experience like Baron Gutenberg does. So he was already involved in the Middle East in some way when he was or he was where well, he held a political office uh well he had previous high level inf- involvement looking at one or more possible peace deals between Israel and its geographic nations you can find that uh, on 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 internet indeed and you can find those activities that he was involved in and uh, the uh, the overseer, the president of the Continuing Church of God, Bob Thiel, has been watching and writing about Karl Theodor to Gutenberg since 2009, because you know certain of his actions uh, uh, and what has happened to his, his career, and the fact that many things he wrote that he could do have been fulfilled. Indeed, uh, have uh, drawn attention of Dr. Bob Thiel, his doctor of natural medicine, to this person. And he also, of course, drew attention, uh, drew attention of the rest of us to that. As time goes on, as, as I'm, as, and as I'm analyzing this person's, uh, biography, character, and expertise, uh, I've come to be, I've come to become, I've, I've come to the point where I'm totally convinced that he is indeed the one who will be sent by Europe to the Middle East to be the European envoy, the European peace broker, and the one who is going to indeed bring about and cur- confirm the peace deal, confirm it for seven years, once the Middle East experiences this uh, regional nuclear conflict, where the main participants will be the State of Israel, uh, Republic of Iran, and obviously Syria, Iranian closest ally. So... Uh, what Bob Thiel has been writing since 2009, he wrote that Karl Theodor to Gutenberg could, uh, you know, uh, fulfill various things. For example, he wrote uh, he wrote uh, an article, Might German Baron Karl Theodor to Gutenberg become the King of the North? He has considered him a possible candidate to become the King of the North of Biblical Prophecy in Daniel chapter 11, verse 40, that we just read a few minutes ago. And he also put up a video related to Karl Theodor zu Gutenberg back in 2016. The video is entitled Karl Theodor zu Gutenberg and Europe's Future. So now, after a likely war between Iran and Israel, probably involving Syria and others, a peace deal will take place. So that's the next step, you see. And Karl Theodor zu Gutenberg looks to be one who could be the prince that confirms the deal for a prophetic week as foretold in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27 and 26. Now, between the time the deal is confirmed and before it is halfway over, Europe will indeed reorganize into a totalitarian superstate, as revealed in the book of Revelation chapter 17, verses 12 and 13. The book of Revelation chapter 17 reveals two beasts, the first beast, that same beast is exactly the, uh, the the king of the north of Daniel chapter 11 verse 40. And that means that the first beast will be the one who will be European envoy uh, into the Middle East who is going to indeed broker this peace. Revelation 17 verses 12 and 13. Uh, speaking now about Europe that will be reorganized in the meantime between the deal is confirmed and be- before it is halfway over. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet. So this is prophecy about those ten kings or ten rulers. But they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. The beast, the first beast, or the king of the north, or the, uh, so the, or the coming European dictator. Verse 13. These are of one mind and they will give their power and authority to the beast, to that one first beast who is indeed the head of the revived Holy Roman Empire. And what is the European Union now? It's nothing else but the revival of the holy, so-called Holy Roman Empire. 
So the leader of this super state, European super state, he'll proclaim peace, you know. He will indeed broker the peace in the Middle East. He'll proclaim peace. But, but in his heart, he will devise military plans as it is revealed in uh, Daniel chapter 8. And those plans will be very successful as revealed in Daniel chapter 11. So let us now see the uh what is now prophesied about this coming European dictator. So he is promoting peace. He's promoting peace and security, but at the same time in his heart he is actually devising the war. Then the chapter eight and verse twenty five. Through his cunning he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule, and he shall exalt himself in his heart. He shall destroy many in their prosperity. He shall even rise against the prince of princes, meaning Jesus Christ, but he shall be broken without human means, which is logical because, you know, when you rise against prince of princes, then you'll be destroyed and broken without human means. So that's the prophecy that in the final uh, conflict with the returning Christ, this Antichrist, as people would like to call him, but Antichrist is a religious title. This is a civil leader. This coming European dictator will be involved, and he'll be, indeed, in that conflict, he'll be completely destroyed. Also, we have in uh, Daniel, now, uh, chapter 11, we see again that uh, this leader, the European, coming European uh, dictator, will proclaim peace but devise military plans in his heart. So, Daniel, chapter 11... Verse 23 and 24. And after the league is made with him, he shall act deceitfully, for he shall come up and become strong with a small number of people. He shall enter peaceably, even into the richest places of the province, and he shall do what his fathers have not done, nor his forefathers. He shall disperse among them the plunder, spoil and riches, and he shall devise his plans against the strongholds, but only for a time. And of course, he'll be successful. So uh, we're in Daniel 11. Let's go to verse 39. Verse 39, which says that um, his successful enterprise will bring him... Verse 39, thus he shall act against the strongest fortresses. The strongest fortresses right now, as you know, uh, when it comes to fortress, it's with reference to military might. Right now, the strongest fortress and fortresses are found in the United States of America. He shall act against the strongest fortresses with a foreign god, which he shall acknowledge and advance its glory. And he shall cause them to rule over many and divide the land for gain. And at the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him. So that's the Arab confederation uh, headed by the king of the south. When it says south and north, it means south of the promised land and north of the promised land. So south of the promised land is the Arab uh, conglomerate of nations. And the king of the north shall come against him, the king of the south, like a whirlwind with chariots, horsemen, and with many ships. And he shall enter the countries, overwhelm them, and pass through. He shall also enter the glorious land, and many countries shall, not, shall be overthrown. But these shall escape from his hand. Edom meaning Turkey, Moab, Jordan, and the prominent people of Ammon, also Jordan. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall have power over treasures of gold and silver, and silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt. Also the Libyans and Ethiopians shall follow at his heels. So, we see how successful this military uh, political leader will indeed be. However, you know, prior to the reorganization of Europe into new regions, because uh, perhaps Europe is going to amalgamate various regions into uh, and amalgamate them into ten big regions. For example, the countries of Benelux might be amalgamated into one region. Uh, it has been often uh, this part of the world where I live has now been often referred to as the Western Balkans region. So perhaps that's exactly what it might happen. So it may not be 10 actual countries. Most likely it will be actually reorganization which when they will amalgamate countries into bigger regions. There will be 10 regions with 10 regional, uh, regional rulers, governors, the horns, and they're all going to receive authority with, with the king as the kings for the, with that beast, with that with that beast, with that king of the north, with that European uh, super state dictator. 
So prior to this reorganization, this beast leader does not have much power, you see, but with a small group backing him, he will attain that power. Remember, we read in Daniel 11, verse 23, there is a small group of people that is going to, you know, help him uh, basically come into power, grab power and come into the power. It says, uh, and uh, after the league is made, verse 23, with him he shall act deceitfully, for he shall come up and become strong with a small number of people. So with a, a small group of his uh, 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 supporters. And then, you see, when the temporary peace deal is in place in the Middle East, I say temporary because it will be broken in the middle, so when that peace is in the place, uh, we have another prophecy that is expected to be fulfilled. The world will finally, you know, be relieved because the world will say, finally, peace and safety. The potential uh, world conflict is now avoided, and they'll celebrate this European peace broker, most likely Karl Theodor zu Gutenberg, as the Messiah, as the one who saved the world from its destruction. In First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3, For when they say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. You see, they'll be saying peace and safety, you know, it's peace conferred for seven years. They'll be, they'll be celebrating peace and safety, not realizing that in the middle of that <laughs> peace deal, meaning after three and a half years, a sudden destruction is going to come upon basically the whole world because the Great Tribulation will start. So, you know, people will think it's time of peace and security, yet it will end up in the time of birth pangs, as you find that uh, uh, expression in Mark chapter 13 and verse 8, quote from the words of Jesus Christ. And those birth pangs, it's also known as the Great Tribulation, of which Jesus Christ warns us in Matthew 24, verse 21. Now, getting back to Daniel 9, it points out that although a deal is made, in the middle it will be over and the sacrifices will be stopped. So we can presume that perhaps part of this peace deal will be to allow the Jews to freely practice their religion by restoring the sacrifices. Now some people have uh, really don't use their common sense and some people, uh, in fact it was in this case was a Protestant fellow who has told me if decidedly, no, there is no way, there will be peace, there will be uh, animal sacrifices restored, because Jesus Christ came and he did away with those sacrifices. Well, I said to this person, yes, that's those of us who accept the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, to us, those sacrifices are not relevant. But don't forget, the Jewish people, the Jewish nation as a whole, never accepted Jesus Christ at his sacrifice. And therefore, they feel that they are not completed as a nation until they have a new temple. There is a huge movement for building the third temple and until they restore the Old Testament sacrifices. So they want, there is a drive in the Jewish nation to restore those sacrifices because it's part of the Jewish identity. It's part of Jewish nationhood after all. Because, you know, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ to them does not apply because they do not accept it anyway. So uh, the fact that Jesus Christ abolish the sacrifices, fulfill the sacrifices, <laughs> will certainly not prevent the Jewish nation from restoring the animal sacrifices because they simply don't accept the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. As simple as that. So, uh, you know, uh, it will be over and the sign, well, the, 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 the event that will end up this, 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 this peace deal in the Middle East will be when the sacrifices are stopped. And obviously sacrifices must start before they're stopped, so prophecy watchers should see the resumption of regular animal sacrifices in the state of Israel as a sign that the start of the Great Tribulation is not too far off. Now, as it turns out, now the former prince, who is later called a king in Daniel 11, is the one who is going to stop the sacrifices. So he's the one. So from being a prince because of his merits for uh, brokering the peace deal in the Middle East, he will be celebrated as the savior of the world, and he will be elected and placed on the position to be heading the European super state. This leader, as I mentioned, has to be of German origin, at least partly, and he has to have some aristocratic background, 
And uh, in the case of Karl Theodor, of Baron Karl Theodor zu Gutenberg, it's a person with very extensive international uh, international experience, a man who has experience with various leaders, a man who lived in the United States for a while. He founded, I think, a financial company in that part of the world. And after the uh, plagiarism scandal, he uh, made another doctorate dissertation, and this time now he's a doctor of philosophy. As far as I've read in one article uh, written about him on 5th of December last year, because that was the uh, his birthday, and uh, that article was very interesting. It just outlined all of the uh, Gutenberg's uh, successes in his life, and it predicted, even the article itself, that there is a very bright future ahead for Karl Theodor zu Gutenberg. Oh yes, I wholeheartedly, I wholeheartedly agree. Well, what more bright future can you have but to be a peace broker in the Middle East, to bring the peace between the Arabs and the Jews, and to have the whole world celebrate you as the savior of the world because you have calmed down the passions in the Middle East and you have uh, prevented the... Uh, the involvement of other big powers and you've prevented the possible third world war as they would think <laughs> well they don't even know what in the meantime using the peace and the time of peace what military endeavors this european dictator will will, will have but we'll talk about that once uh once this peace deal is underway because when the peace deal will be brokered it will be the time to remind all of you my dear friends that the peace broker from Europe is the future European European dictator, be that Karl Deodor zu Gutenberg or somebody else, but it's most likely him, and I'm I myself am convinced that it is him more and more. So uh, we need then at that time I'm going to remind you of that he'll be the the peace broker from Europe will be the future European the coming European dictator, and then at that point I'll just tell you what he will accomplish as far as Bible prophecies are concerned. When once he uh, once he gets and, and and steps into the power, once he becomes the actual European European leader, so uh, the former prince, who is later called a king in Daniel eleven, is the one who will stop the sacrifices, as he is going to break the peace deal in 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 the middle of that peace deal. It's in Daniel chapter eleven verse thirty one. And says, and forces shall be mastered by him, and they shall defile the sanctuary fortress. Then they shall take away the daily sacrifices and place there the abomination of desolation. So yes, my dear friends, there will come a militaristic European king who will enter Israel. Before he becomes the European king, the European president, he's going to be the European envoy. In the Middle East, he's going to indeed broker the peace deal confirmed for seven years. And he'll be the one to break that uh, that peace deal in its middle. Could the leader of a coming European super state be Karl Deodor zu Gutenberg? Oh yes, indeed. Very much so. He is the prime candidate for that position, so he is the one to watch. So either he might be the one, or he will be at least uh, among, in that small group of people, the small group of individuals, who will indeed support the one who will fill that role. So prophecy watchers, those of you who follow the Bible, keep in mind the words of Jesus Christ in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 13, verse 37, and what I say to you, I say to all, watch. So let's just uh, make a summary of what I've just said, because sometimes it's complex and people have problem to follow it. So what we are to expect very soon to happen, relatively soon, is the nuclear regional war conflict in the Middle East. The result of that will be the peace deal prophesied in Daniel 9. So the peace deal of prophesied in Daniel, uh, of Daniel chapter 9 it will be the product of the nuclear regional conflict. So the, the, the Abraham Accord that President, former President Trump began, it's not the peace deal. Uh, the peace deal is nothing, no accord that might be signed in the meantime. The peace deal of Daniel chapter 9 comes as the result of the nuclear regional warfare. Okay, so out of nuclear regional warfare that will start in the Middle East will come the peace deal. The peace deal will be confirmed for seven years. The person who will 
indeed brokered that peace deal from Europe, will be of German origin, of aristocratic background, and he will be Roman Catholic, not a strong believer, but nevertheless will belong to the Roman Catholic uh, confession. What is important to you to know is that that peace broker will be indeed elected the president of the European super state, or rather we can call him European dictator. And he'll use those three and a half years of peace in the Middle East to devise some other of his military plans, of which part of those military plans will be to, to attack basically Jerusalem, to march into Jerusalem, to uh, abolish the daily sacrifices that, that the Jews are going to uh, resume in Jerusalem, and that will be the beginning of the Great Tribulation. The Great Tribulation is going to bring some other troubles and problems. Primarily, it will be the attack on the modern House of Israel and the uh, leaders of the modern House of Israel, the Anglo-Saxon nations. But we'll be talking about those things once he becomes the president then, or when during those peace discussions, when they will be underway in the Middle East, following the horrible regional nuclear conflict, we are going, I'm then going to announce to you what, according to the Bible, this person, this future coming European dictator is going to accomplish once he gets into the power. Uh, we'll be talking about that. So right now, what is ahead of us? We don't know exactly when, but relatively soon. Brethren and friends, we need to be watching for, we need to be watching for the regional nuclear conflict in the Middle East. The result of that will be the peace deal that will be brokered by a European envoy. That envoy that Europe is going to send to the Middle East is the future European dictator. And that future European dictator will be, of course, the chief chief of arms, chief of the coming European army. And then, in the meantime, while the peace deal is still going on, he's going to be devising his own military plan. And then in the middle of that peace deal, after three and a half years, three and a half years after that peace deal is signed, he is going to break it. And then he'll fulfill some other Bible prophecies. I think that you need to know these things clearly in your mind so that you can know what is to be expected in the near future. The current conflict in Ukraine has indeed drawn much attention of the whole world, has caused various economic difficulties, but uh, what nobody seems to be expecting is, or perhaps more and more will expect as it comes closer, but nobody would really truly believe it would happen, will be this nuclear uh, conflict in the Middle East. Uh, as the result of that, we'll have the peace deal. As a result of that, we'll have the European dictator. As a result of that, we'll have the dictator using the time of peace to devise his own military plans. And uh, once, once he is in power and in position to do that, he will indeed then fulfill another batch of Bible prophecies. So, until some next time, goodbye, friends.